good morning to all of you. I want to thank you uh, for being here today. My name is Larry Zari, and I'm very honored to be the Master of Ceremonies for the day. Um, it is wonderful to see so many people. Uh, let me tell you, over the years, uh, we only had the row in front here, and then now we've increased the row to each side. And it is, it is wonderful to see so many of you come, and uh, we've requested, we've done everything we can in the community. Uh, we have uh, put ads in the, in the newspaper, and of course there were, there were editorials written in the local newspaper also. I've done everything I can on my TV program, and others have also. It is just wonderful to know that so many, and of course uh, the, the chamber has blasted every one of their members to make sure that uh, everyone comes, because this is such an important day. It is, it's, it's kind of a day that uh, uh, what, what else can we say to each other and say we are giving one hour uh, of our daily routine uh, on Memorial Day for the men and women uh, that have given us the opportunity, that have given us the right to be here today. Uh, I can't fathom uh, if, if those men and women had not fought for our freedoms, what would we be doing today? Because it, uh, our country would be totally different. And that's why we're paying homage, we're paying our respects today. And it's not a one day, one hour of ceremony. We ought to give our respects to our men and women that are serving today in the armed forces and then those that have given their lives over the years. And it's just wonderful to know. It, one of the things that I was going to leave you with, that whenever you run into someone in uniform and you know they are serving our country, don't be shy. Walk up to them and say, thank you. Thank you very much for um, giving us the freedoms. Thank you very much for fighting for our country. And thank you very much for serving the United States of America. And now, um, I want to, we were going to start with the invocation with Peter Jensen, Lieutenant Commander, U.S. Navy Chaplain, retired. Lieutenant Commander Jensen. Will you join me in prayer? Almighty God and Father in heaven, I thank you that men have set up memorials for thousands of years, such as the 12 stones from the River Jordan, which you stopped flowing, to enable your people Israel to cross over on dry land. Memorials that cause children and grandchildren to ask their parents why they exist. Thank you that in America, hundreds of towns from Avalon, Santa Catalina to our eastern seaboard have established memorials like this one, celebrating the lives and the courage of America's armed forces. Young people who have fought and sometimes died to preserve precious liberty. Thank you for leaders here in Glendale who ensure that there is such a time of remembrance here in this place. We commend the speakers for today's ceremony to you, Lord asking that all which is said and done here would redound to your glory and our encouragement. I do ask in thy name, which is above every name. Amen. Thank you very much, Lieutenant Commander Jensen. And now for the presentation of colors, Lieutenant Colonel David Worley, U.S. Air Force, retired. Ladies and gentlemen, we all please rise for the presentation of the colors, the Pledge of Allegiance, and our national anthem. Please join me as we honor the flag of this great country now in its 235th year. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. 
We will now have the national anthem sung by the acapella choir of Glendale High School. Oh, say can you see by the dawn's early light what so proudly we held at the twilight's last gleaming whose bright stripes and bright stars through the perilous fight o'er the ramparts we watched were so gallantly streaming and the rocket's red flare the bombs bursting in air gave proof to the night that our plan was still there oh say does that star spangled banner yet wave o'er the land of the free Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. Please be seated. First, I want to introduce to you uh, Congressman, our own Congressman, Adam Schiff. Uh, by the way, every year, Congressman Adam Schiff brings from Washington a flag that was flown on the, on the Capitol uh, as a gift for us. And then, so you see the American flag, it was given in, uh, uh, to us by Congressman Adam Schiff. Supervisor Michael Antonovich. Everybody knows Supervisor Antonovich. <laughs> Our own mayor, Laura Friedman. <laughs> Former mayor, council member Rafi Manukian. Former Mayor, Council Member, Arana Jarian. Former Mayor, Council Member, Frank Quintero. But I also want each and every one of you to recognize all of these handsome looking, these wonderful looking men in uniform. And I am so proud of them. They are the fire department and our police department. Let's give them a big hand. Let me tell you. Uh, these are the folks that make the city of Glendale a great place to live. And now, uh, remarks from the mayor of the city of Glendale, Mayor Laura Friedman. Thank you, Larry. Good morning. On behalf of the city of Glendale and my colleagues on the Glendale City Council, I want to welcome you here this morning to the Veterans Memorial at Glendale City Hall. To the veterans here today and to the active military here today, I want to offer you a very special welcome. You truly honor us with your presence. On this solemn day, we gather to remember and acknowledge the selfless sacrifice of our fallen heroes. We also thank our military personnel, their families, our veterans, and all those who have lost loved ones in the service of our nation. From the patriots who fought the British when our nation was founded, to the troops who serve today in Afghanistan and around the world, men and women of courage have answered the call of duty with bravery and with dedication. We are grateful for and humbled by their sacrifice and devotion. Memorial Day embodies our pledge to forever carry them in our hearts and in our history. Today we also renew our vow to care for our veterans and the families that they left behind. And I'm very proud to tell you that the city of Glendale takes that commitment very seriously. Just last month, we approved a housing project that's the first project in the city of Glendale to include a component for veterans housing. This project, yes. Thank you. This project, which is in conjunction with Glendale Memorial Hospital, the city of Glendale, and Mercy Housing, 
will provide veterans and their families with specialized medical care and services, and of course, housing. In Glendale, we have committed to ending veterans homelessness in our city, and we will do that by next year. But you know, the gratitude for our American servicemen and servicewomen does not end at our shores. My husband, Guillaume, is French, and we visit his family in Europe. It always happens that people, usually older people that have more of a memory of the past, will come up to us, because I'm an American, and thank me for the sacrifice that our nation made on behalf of those countries and our allies. They still remember. European nations are still grateful for what America did for them in World War II. And that's remarkable. In the midst of the Civil War, President Abraham Lincoln challenged our nation to care for him who shall have, who shall have borne the battle and for his widow and his orphan, to do all which may achieve and cherish a just and lasting peace amongst ourselves and with all nations. This commitment is just as true today as it was in Abraham Lincoln's time. We must always to continue, continue to work for and pray for peace in a world free of war. For certainly the privileges and the freedoms that we enjoy in this nation would not be possible if it were not for the great sacrifice of those who served our country. We will always remember and we will always honor them. Thank you all for attending today. Your presence is a tribute to all of those who sacrifice for our nation. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mayor Laura Friedman. And now, um, I would like to ask Lieutenant Colonel Dave Worley to come to the lectern, and uh, he is going to conduct the POW MIA table ceremony. Ladies and gentlemen, please direct your attention to my left. On the ground, in front of the POW MIA table, is a tribute to our fallen soldiers. The combat boots represent the final march of the soldiers' last battle. This fitting tribute reminds us of those from all branches of service that gave the ultimate sacrifice. That brings us to the POW MIA table. At this time, we ask that you remain seated yet silent as we conduct the POW MIA ceremony. This ceremony is rich with military tradition as we honor those men and women of our armed forces who in defense of the freedoms of our country and that of the free world are unaccounted for and are classified as prisoners of war or missing in action. We are specifically honoring the sacrifice of hundreds of thousands of Americans held prisoner of war and those still listed as missing in action since the time of the American Revolution. Some died from disease and starvation. Some perished in death marches. Some were tortured. Some were lost. Gone forever from their families. All were deprived of their liberties so that you may enjoy yours. At all military functions where meals are served, these heroes are always honored and remembered.
prisoners of war and those missing in action from all wars. They are not with us today. The table is round to show that our concern for them is never ending. The tablecloth is white, symbolizing the purity of their intentions to respond to their country's call to arms so that their children could remain free. The five hats represent each branch of our armed forces. Let us remember all the men and women prisoners of war that are too often forgotten. We must never forget them. The lone candle symbolizes the frailty of a prisoner alone trying to stand up against his oppressors. The yellow candle and the yellow ribbon on the candle remind us of those who will not be coming home. The single red rose reminds us of the loved ones and families of our comrades in arms who keep the faith and await their return. The red ribbon on the rose represents the love of our country which inspired them to answer the nation's call. The black napkins on the table stand for the emptiness these warriors have left in the hearts of their family and friends. A slice of lemon is on the bread plate to remind us of their bitter fate if we do not bring them home. There is salt on the plate, symbolic of the family's tears as they wait and remember. The glass is inverted reminding us that our distinguished comrades cannot be with us to join in the ceremony today. Maybe tomorrow, if we remember. The faded picture on the table is a reminder that they are missed very much and are remembered by their families. chair depicts an unknown face, representing no specific soldier, sailor, airman, marine, or coast guardsman, but all are here with us today. The POW MIA flag is raised at half-staff to mourn the fact that many of our comrades will not return to our shores and to pay tribute to their passing. As we look upon this empty table, do not remember ghosts from the past, but remember our comrades. Remember those whom we depended on in battle. They depend on us to bring them home. Remember our friends. They are the ones we love who love life and freedom as we do, they will remember what we do. Please honor and remember them. Thank you very much. POW MIA ceremony, Lieutenant Colonel David Worley. He does such a good job. Um, as I said, I will forget some people that I have, uh, I'd like to introduce from the school board, uh, from our school board. Mary Bogart is here. Where's, uh, where's Mary? That's, there she is. Um, I also want to recognize uh, two families that are here. Uh, their, um, their family's name, uh, one, their son, his name is inscribed uh, and is, is on the wall. First, the Rovago family, they never missed it. Their son was uh, a big Thank you. Thank you for coming. 
And then the Jensen family from Simi Valley. Let's give them a big hand. The Glendale Veterans Memorial, dedicated in 1997, currently has five panels with the names of local residents who gave the ultimate sacrifice in defense of our rights so we can enjoy our freedoms. The panels span the, city, the periods covering World War I, World War II, Korea, Vietnam, and those who are currently serving um, in, uh, in you know, protecting our, the, um, our country and protect, protecting the world. Uh, Amer and and uh, they are engaged in the America the, um, from terror. This year, the names of 51 veterans who gave the ultimate sacrifice during World Wars I, II, Korea and Vietnam have been inscribed on the memorial panels. Each of these individuals have been verified as former Glendale residents. Today, these individuals whose names are inscribed will be honored. During the ceremony, a member of the ROTC guard will lay a rose on the panel for each individual whose name will be read today. Assisting Patriotism Committee member um, in, in the reading of the names are two people prominent in our community who have the highest regard and deepest respect for the veterans of our past and present. These individuals are Congressman Adam Schiff from the 29th Congressional District and Los Angeles County Mayor Supervisor Michael Antonovich uh, from the 5th District of the County and a former veteran. Ladies and gentlemen, let's extend a warm welcome to these distinguished individuals. From World War I, James M. McLeod. From World War II, Edmund J. Alvarado. Albert R. Angerstein. Dwayne M. Betke. William J. Brady, Jr. George S. Brashears. Moral B. Crossland. Charles Davis. Lee R. Downey. Webb D. Elmaker. James B. Gabriel. Llewellyn R. Gray. Alvin R. Hart. Jack H. Hastings. James T. Holcomb. Dean P. Hope. George Hunter, Jr. Donald E. Jones. William C. Jones. Robert J. Carl. Norman R. Kramer. Martin E. Labayak. Gordon R. Lofgren. Walter Logan. Carl D. McGee. James D. Matlin. James Matthews, Jr. John M. Mobile Hill. Jack M. Musser. Richard V. Newhouse. Stuart H. Nixon. Joseph F. Pace. George C. Rogers. Cedric J. Roher. Louis A. Salmon. Jack A. Steinberger. Harry A. Sturwalt. Elmer J. Stone. John Strong, Jr. Donald S. Tozer. Charles O. Valois. Robert H. Wardell. Edgar C. Wildman, Jr.
I just want to thank the Citizens Commemorative Committee for the extraordinary job that they do every year. Uh, and I want to thank all of you that are in attendance today that are veterans that have served this country so nobly. We are in all of your sacrifice and your contribution to our country makes such a beautiful day like this possible. I also want to thank the, the woman who will be introduced later who did all the research to identify those people from the city of Glendale who were lost in World War I and World War II. She did an extraordinary job uh, researching these names and I know Mike and I are very proud to participate in their recognition for the first time during this Memorial Day ceremony. So I want to thank you all for coming uh, and thank uh, our veterans for this beautiful service to this country. God bless. I also want to thank Glendale for having this program each year because it recognizes those who have given the ultimate to have a country that we have today. As I said earlier today at the Montrose Memorial Service, all of our freedoms from freedom of religion, freedom to assemble, freedom to participate in our government, freedom of the press, all of those freedoms are a direct result of the men and women who served this country and given the ultimate and who are serving today. Uh, this past Saturday we had the county's annual veterans event. We had about 7,000 plus at Arcadia Park and we had the opportunity of having the new commanding general of the California National Guard, General Baldwin, who has just returned from Viet, I should say, returned from Afghanistan, where he and his son were both serving our country at the same time. He will now assume the command of the California National Guard. He will be elevated to Brigadier General next week. A fine man, along with General Gravitz, who is the new Secretary of Veterans Affairs for the State of California, appointed by the Governor, and who also had a distinguished career as a commanding general and also a Los Angeles County police officer. But with, again, want to stress that this is not a day of barbecues and staying home from work. It's a day that we recognize those who gave the ultimate to have this opportunity that we have today our peace and our freedom. Thank you. Thank you very much, Congressman Adam Schiff and uh, Supervisor Michael Antonovich. Um, once again, I mentioned earlier that uh, there are those that are members of our uh, Citizenship and Patriotism Committee uh, get very little recognition, work very hard. Uh, it's a year-round kind of a thing. We uh, we start meeting again next month and getting ready for next year. I would very much like to have the members of the Patriotism Committee um, and uh, of the Chamber of Commerce to stand up and, and wave their hands so we thank them and recognize them. Let's give them a big hand. Major Haney served during World War II in the Pacific Theater as the XXX pilot ferrying supplies to the theater and bringing injured military personnel to San Francisco for medical treatment. Ladies and gentlemen, Major George Haney. Good morning. I'm, I'm able to get up when I have rails, but like today, I was glad to have the help. First, I'd like to, tie, to thank retired Glendale Fire Chief Don Biggs and Lieutenant Colonel Dave Worley for this opportunity to speak today. I'm also honored to be on the stage with Major General Mark McCarley and Rear Admiral Don Coughlin. If there was anybody left in my squadron, they'd say, man, George, you really got up with these two men. <laughs> uh, perhaps my greatest honor here is to be with families and friends of those brave servicemen and whose names will be added to the wall of honor today. We suit their patriotism. I'm lucky to be here today representing the World War II. In October 1st, I'll be 96 years old and have been uh, 
And I've been attending these ceremonies for 63 years. Uh, in 1950 uh, and 60, we had parades up and down Brown Boulevard from Colorado to, uh, well, what do you, yeah. And anyhow, from that time, <laughs> from that time on, Doran was what I was looking for. So from that time on, gosh, it's just been so grateful to, uh, to attend these. And uh, I, as I sat in the audience, over these years, near the end, I'd say, gee, I'd be sure grateful to have somebody or that I could speak to tell about World War II. And here we go. You know, I, I had just graduated from San Jose State College, had a job in Hawaii, was a PE major at Kamehameha High School, and here comes the draft. Well, rather than wait to be drafted because I was certainly, uh, here we go. I was certainly, uh, I said, well, I gotta, I'm gonna join something. I don't wanna wait to be drafted. So I went in the Air Force, came back, to, sent back to California, went through the flying schools, graduated from Luke Field, exactly, um, exactly one year after Pearl Harbor. Now when Pearl Harbor hit, here we are. Nice Sunday morning, everybody in church, in they come. There's 65 fighter pilots, or all kinds of pilots, that hit uh, Pearl Harbor, and they just destroyed everything. Then another 65 comes in. So with those two deals and their carriers were out about 250 miles out, they just destroyed everything. So after I graduated from flying school, I was in a pursuit school, supposedly. So my first uh, assignment was as a co-pilot in a ACFC, which is Air Corps Ferry Command, and we took planes from Hamilton Field, which is about 35 miles north of San Francisco, out to everywhere that needed it. And my first trip was a lot rather wet in that we, <laughs> it was right after the war, you know. We didn't have enough gas in the planes, the P-51, P-38, huh, to get to Honolulu. So they had banks of uh, gasoline in the tanks. Well, everything worked well, but the tanks didn't feed out and we had to ditch a plane in uh, the Pacific, uh, 150 miles north of, uh, or east of, uh, of uh, uh, Honolulu. So we were on a life raft, we got saved. It was the greatest thing that ever happened. So from then on, we went into these different islands, taking planes, and we were getting just clobbered in the war. And, and here's two things that I want to tell that really pepped you up. General Doolittle, Ask Cap Arnold, he says, give me 25 planes I can put on carriers. We'll go to Japan as close as we can, and then boom. You know, it was, those planes had 5,000 square foot runways. Here they are on a carrier. But they did everything, the speed and everything. The General Doolittle was the first man off. Bang. They got Japan and Japanese said, what happened? Where'd they come from? They dropped from the moon. So that really uh, gave us a boost. And the next thing was Midway. Midway was really the battle that saved us. I mean, our morale was terrible. We didn't have imagine trying to get planes in six months. So, uh, so in Midway, we, we sank four Japanese destroyers, three with torpedoes and one with the B-17 that got the bomb. So from that time on, it picked the morale up and you can imagine the people that they, uh, the people that they brought in for all different services and went to all the other islands. Now the thing that happened too is that uh, 
the skies are nice. What the, what happened? What happened, you know? And so he just went. The Guadalcanal was tough. So they said, we can't do Guadalcanal. So here they go. We do stair steps. We go from Kwajalein. I want to name these islands, which I just have to. But they go to Kwajalein, Saipan, and then down to Tinian and Guam, over to Lady Gulf, and then up to um, Iwo Jima and Okinawa. And every one of those battles, we lost, man, you can't believe. But boy, we did a good job. And doggone it, I'm so proud to be here. And uh, at Okinawa, we, we were taking everything in there. Why were we taking it in? Because that was going to be the island that we were going to invade Japan. And, you know, it was, we were just, well, here we are, do what we had to do. But we, they asked, they asked Japan to please surrender. We're just gonna, so they wouldn't do it. So they dropped two atomic bombs, which was terrible. But without that, they said we'd lose uh, million men trying to evade into Japan. So, you know, I'm so proud to be here today, and I'm going to do something. Tom Brokoff, you know, wrote a uh, book about uh, the greatest generation, and he had, you know, things from people writing, people meeting, and it was a very popular book. And so today, I'm going to enlarge the greatest generation into World War I, to Korea, Vietnam, and all the present deals we're in to uh, kind of get them into the greatest generation. And thanks for having me. Major George Haney. The next speaker is um, a friend of mine, um, Navy uh, Rear Admiral Dan Coughlin, a local resident who served during, world, uh, during the Vietnam and Cold Wars, serving as the commander of USS Kitty Hawk, the Cuban Missile Crisis. Um, and of course, that you you sometimes need to sit with uh, Rear Admiral Dan Coughlin, and he'll tell you stories that just are absolutely amazing, uh, some of the things. Ladies and gentlemen, let me bring to the lectern uh, Rear Admiral Dan Coughlin. Good morning. Thank you, Larry, very much for the introduction. A little background, um, went to Naval Academy in 1956, graduated in 1960, stayed in carrier aviation my, almost my entire career in the Navy of 35 years. Uh, had uh, well over 1,500 carrier landings, and uh, in the Vietnam area had about 232 missions over North and South Vietnam, so I've, had, I've been there and done that. I'd like to tell you, uh, just take about two, three minutes and say the important things I think about Vietnam that probably most of you don't know. A few years ago, I had a chance to address you and we talked about the Cuban crisis and I think a lot of people came away with a, a different view of it. So maybe the Vietnam War will be a little bit different after today. October 1963, uh, Premier Diem of South Vietnam and his brother, who was his chief advisor, were assassinated. The brother's wife was Madame Nu. She was the wife of the brother, the uh, premier of South Vietnam at that time was a bachelor, so he had, did not have a wife, so she was the person who did the talking for them. She immediately accused John F. Kennedy, President of the United States, of assisting both, of assassinating both men and attempting to overthrow the South Vietnamese government. She swore to kill JFK. 
John F. Kennedy was killed November 22, 1963. Maybe someday we'll get to know the answers. Madame New died in Paris, France in April of this year. She had been exiled to France in 1964 and was kept there in Paris until her death. She has publicly taken credit for the Kennedy assassination as a vendetta. Lyndon Johnson expanded the Vietnam War on a false promise. Two U.S. destroyers had been fired upon by North Vietnamese gunboats. False premise, again. The attack never really occurred because they did not have gunboats that were sufficient to attack our destroyers. The U.S. lost 58,000 personnel in uniform during the following decade before the evacuation of Saigon in 1975. What a loss of human life. And for what? Today we honor those personnel as well as all who died in the service of the United States. Thank you. Thank you very much, Rear Admiral Dan Coghlan. And now let me uh, ask for the one of the committee members of the Patriotism and Citizenship Committee, Linda Mushin, an amateur genealogist who has spent hours uh, at the Southern California Genealogy Society Library looking for names. She has done a lot of work. Let me ask Linda Mushin to come to the factory. From the Korean War, Gerald K. Frizzo, Gordon R. Galloway, from the, Vietnam, from the Vietnam War, Stephen P. Barnett, Leon B. Cox, James H. Flickinger, Douglas G. Jensen, Ronald R. King, James Titmus III. Thank you very much for the question. Major General Mark McCarley, a Glendale resident, Boy, we, I knew him when he was an attorney, and uh, he, I didn't realize that he's going to get up to now. Uh, you've done such a great job. You bring such great honor for us. And a veteran of today's global war on terror currently serves as Deputy Commanding General, United States Army Reserve, 1st Army, and Commanding General of the United States Army Reserve Support Command, 1st Army. Ladies and gentlemen, with great pride, I'd like to introduce you Major General Mark McCarley. Good morning, all, and to uh, distinguished community leaders, all are distinguished here, fellow veterans, members of our great fire department and police department, proudly serving the city of Glendale, and all of my friends, all of you. I'm really honored, humbled to speak, because before me, are so many of you who have given so much to this United States and to the communities in which you live, to include Major Haney, a brilliant speech, and so reflective of the commitment of young men and women then and now to the call from our nation for service any place, anywhere in the world. I sometimes wish, however, in the uh, several times that I have spoken at this affair, this great event today, Memorial Day, that more of our community would make the effort and spend the hour 
to say thank you that is my dream and my hope because today is not really about the right or the wrong of our country's great strategy against global terrorism or against architects of death and human suffering. And those individuals continue to plague our world and we are responding to those threats and to that menace. Really today's just about those men and women, George, Admiral Coughlin, Coughlin, and the individual soldiers, the sailors, the Marines, and airmen, today and in the past, who were willing to risk all, and in so many instances, give all for their country. So that's why we're here today. That's it. And in defense of this country, our grandfathers, fathers, mothers, sisters, brothers, your spouses, we've answered the nation's call to arms for the 200 odd years of our country's history, and especially today as we honor those veterans of World War I, II, Korea, Vietnam, Desert Storm, Iraqi freedom, enduring freedom and all the other conflicts where the preservation of our security and the defense of freedom and our American values required the application of military force. So this call continues and since September 11th, 2001, thousands more of your children, your friends, young men and women and sometimes I say older ones, not so young, from across this nation, including reservists and National Guardsmen have left their homes and families to defend those principles, the same principles that have been so eloquently spoken of today. And when they do so, they know that their tearful goodbyes upon deployment might be their last real contact which they will have with those they love and those who love them. So if you look at these five marble slabs, these represent those who have given all for this country. Now between the first black slab and the last, I calculated it spans about 94 years marked by five major conflicts in which our sailors, soldiers, Marines, Airmen, Coast Guard have done what the country asks them to do regardless of cost. Now you wouldn't think that there's much in common between the Doughboys of 1918 or to the GIs who pummeled the Nazis between 41 and 45, or the sailors and marines doing the same thing at the same time in the Pacific, or between us from Desert Storm Enduring Freedom and Iraqi Freedom, and the American warriors of all branches of the service who stopped the North Korean invasion at the Han River, or between us and the veterans of Vietnam who valiantly fought a war, not of their own choosing, with nothing in the way of appreciation, but spittle in the face from many of their peers in the U.S. who condemned not only the war itself, but all those who fought so heroically in Southeast Asia. But, not, but just because there's a huge difference in age, differences in age, taste in music, clothes between ourselves and the veterans of 1918, of 41-45, of 62 to 72, of 50 to 53, we're all one. We're one as brothers and sisters. We forged that brotherhood, sisterhood, in sweat, 
and many times in blood. So those heroes from the present war and our wars of the past have given in their own way a part of their lives. They understand, sort of a theme I keep repeating, they understand what is meant by three of the most forgotten, forsaken, sometimes completely disregarded words in the English language, and that is duty, service, and sacrifice. So many of you have your own heartfelt memories on this special day, the few of you who are here. In my family, granddaddy Art Jones McCarley, he served as a first sergeant 315th Regiment, 28th Infantry Division. 28th still involved, interestingly, in the war on terrorism. We committed that unit multiple times to Iraq. He was gassed and severely wounded in the Battle of Marne, and he never fully recovered. My old man, John McCarley, through 35 combat missions, B-17 over Germany, surviving a crash, multiple encounters with flak, on the other side of my family, Uncle Jim Termini lost his life in Vietnam. All of us have those stories, those memories of that man or woman who gave all for their country. So I end by saying that because there will always be evil, prejudice, intolerance, and depotism in this world, this United States will continue and will have to ask its children to make those same sacrifices that you and your relatives have made before them. So we should all be proud today of our veterans of the past, you whom I salute, and those extraordinary men and women, some of whom are in the ROTC, Air Force ROTC, under the command of Dave Worley. And uh, those who have risked their lives in this war and will continue to do so every day for our country, far from home and far from family. Thank you very much for those comments, Major General Mark. And now, if you want to hold your tears, um, I would like to ask Tisa Tanke Manukin to come to the lectern, or wherever she's comfortable, to sing God Bless America. And we want to thank Tisa. She does this every year. She does it so beautifully. I want to thank Judy Kendall, the Executive Director of the Chamber of Commerce, for letting us have Tisa Manukin, and we told her one time, can we steal her away? She said, no, no, you can't do that. But Judy, thank you very much. Thanks. Lift 
how appropriate to have the flyover during the time she was singing God Bless America. Tisa, thank you very much once again. Um, we are getting close to the end of the program. I want to take this opportunity to thank all of you for being here. Every year I say the same thing. I like to see young people come. And if you can, next year hopefully you'll bring young, young people because we need to have them understand what America is all about, why we celebrate, why are we here on Memorial Day. If our kids don't understand, if our kids don't carry the tradition, we are going to have a loss, a generation loss, and we can't do that. This country has many new immigrants, and immigrants have to come to these kinds of functions so they can understand we can all be together uh, understanding and paying our respects to our men and women uh, that have given their life, that have given the ultimate sacrifice for the freedoms that we enjoy in this country. I am an immigrant, and I understand what it is to be an American. And let me tell you, there is no greater country, there is no better place for us to be and enjoy the freedoms that we enjoy. And I want to thank all of you for being here. And now, for the benediction, Again, Peter Jensen, Lieutenant Commander, U.S. Navy. May I ask you to please rise for the benediction and also remain standing for taps. Let us pray. Holy God, our Father, I pray that you would bless and prosper those who are presently serving in harm's way in isolated and dangerous places, that those who have given their very lives may not have died in vain. May freedom be preserved here at home and spread around the entire world. We do thank you particularly for the many who have sacrificed life and limb for the cause of freedom. 
grant our military success in their challenging endeavors and grant wisdom to their leaders, both at home and abroad. We also ask, Lord, for your mercy and comfort to be felt by the widows, children, parents, and friends of those who have more recently suffered death due to their service in, our, in our armed forces. And for those who have been seriously wounded or maimed, whose lives are forever changed by their service, grant each of us faith and trust in thy Son, Jesus Christ, who alone gave his life in a supernatural, sacrificial, and redeeming way, dying that we might live eternally with you in your kingdom. And I thank you for the sufficiency of Christ's sacrifice of his own life as the Lamb of God and release from the penalty of our sins who trust in Jesus as Lord and Savior. Bless us as we dismiss. I pray in Jesus' matchless name. Amen. Thank you very much. Thanks. Have a great weekend.